Okay, so let's go. Okay, so this is this lecture, so a much shorter lecture. It's basically everything you wanted to know about contrast and stuff you didn't. Um, so sometimes we talk about contrast, and even attending physicians I meet in other, you know, in medicine, they don't really, they kind of understand, but not really. Okay, so hopefully this helps. Okay, benefits of IV contrast. So obviously with the different, there's oral contrast, IV. Let's talk about IV contrast. Okay. IV contrast, so just a picture of it, clear. You can power inject it, so you hook up the patient with the IV, okay, so in the IV, and then you could either hand inject it, the technologist just injects it, um, and it circulates in your system, or the, uh, the machine can time it and then inject at a certain rate, fast rate, slow rate, whatever you tell the computer to do, okay? And what it is is they inject the, the veins, it goes to your heart, and basically pumps out aorta, goes to your whole body, okay? To your bowel, everywhere, okay? And so just knowing this picture and how it's delivered, um, I have, you know, people have asked me like, oh, we're doing a contrast study of the hand, so can I give like minuscule contrast so that I can image the hand? But you understand it doesn't work that way. The contrast goes all over the body. And so you pretty much need the similar dose, even if you're just or imaging a small hand, because the contrast has to get there. You're not injecting the hand, you're injecting the vein, which goes through this and then goes to your arteries and um, enhances different structures, okay? So hopefully that's clear, okay? The basis of contrast is that, at least for X-ray and CT, is these are X-ray rays, and the contrast is a, um, most of the time it's iodine, and sometimes barium for floral studies. And these, you notice, are heavy, have heavy atomic weights, okay? So basically, they attenuate the x-ray beam. So the x-ray goes through, and let's say that it's going through bone, okay? And it shoots the bone, the bone attenuates the x-ray beam, and that's why it, we have it look like white on an x-ray. And on contrast, same thing, it attenuates the x-ray beam, and it looks white or bright on CT or X or uh, CT mainly or fluoroscopy. Okay, and um, contrast improves the evaluation of vessels. Um, focal lesion detection, uh, lesion characterization. So not only detecting a lesion, let's say a liver lesion, but I can now characterize what that liver lesion is, and I'm distinguishing between adjacent structures. And I'll show you pictures of what that is. Okay, so here is a non-contrast CT and everything is just this gray blob. You can see like liver, kidney just by the anatomy, but it's basically, remember the three dense, like fat, bone, and gray soft tissue. But you can't really distinguish what's what else. Here's the aorta with calcifications. This patient also just happened to have oral contrast on board, okay? But you give contrast and you can start seeing something. You can see the vessels. Here's the aorta. If you're not sure what type of study it is, always look at the aorta because a non-contrast study there's not going to be contrast. On a contrast study there's always contrast in the aorta. Okay? But you can start to see a different um, anatomy, the cortex of the kidney, the med medulla, um, different structures, okay? and I'll show you different things. Okay? So you can start to see anatomy better. Okay? Um, let's say a renal cyst. Okay? So but because the, the kidneys are enhancing you can, this cyst, which is not enhancing, not supposed to enhance, it stands out better. On the non-contrast study, you can kind of still yeah. see the cyst, but it's just much harder to see. So you see how s contrast brings out, let's say that you have a liver lesion, okay? On a non-contrast, it may be very hard to see it, almost imp sometimes impossible to see. But on a contrast, you, may, you would see it because it either enhances or it, it enhances less than normal a liver, just like the cyst enhances less than normal kidney, okay? So um, contrast is very needed for, like, remember said, infection tumor, okay? Non-contrast evaluation for calcification, this one we touched on, the non-contrast, these are the renal calculi, this is a calculus in the ureter, left ureter. Now, with contrast, because the contrast is excreted by the kidneys, it's bright. This is contrast. This is the same patient, okay? But I can't tell if that is a stone or contrast. Is that a stone or contrast? This is a stone, but 
this is contrast. You can't, they're both bright. Okay, that's why, hence the need for a non contrast study for renal calculi. Again, this is excreting contrast in the renal pelvis. Okay, so contrast is also used for distinguishing between adjacent structures in close close proximity. Okay, so let's let's talk about the chest. Okay, here's the mediastinum. In a non contrast study, I know by anatomy this is ascending aorta, ascending thoracic aorta, descending thoracic aorta, pulmonary artery, main pulmonary right and left. Okay, and this is the um, bronchi left right bronchi left bronchi esophagus. Okay, but what is this? What is that? Okay, well if I give contrast, okay, I see that this structure right here lights up just like a vessel, which is it, a, it is a vessel, and this doesn't light up. This is a lymph node. Okay, so it distinguishes between adjacent by giving contrast. I know okay what's vessel, what's lymph node, what's different uh, different structures. Distinguish between adjacent rather than having this gray blob. Okay, again more anatomy. Okay, for the lungs themselves, you don't necessarily need contrast, and that's because lung or air, lung is mostly made out of it's air. Okay, so air is black. Okay, so if you were to have a pulmonary nodule, it doesn't really matter if I give contrast or not, because that pulmonary nodule, let's say that's a pulmonary, it's it's a vessel, but let's say that's a pulmonary nodule, it stands out against the background of air. Okay, just like it would be here, regardless of contrast or non-contrast. Okay, so for pulmonary nodules, you tech, you don't really need contrast. Okay. No no Protocols. Okay, so the question is, okay, I know it's a CT study. I know, uh, do I order it with contrast? Do I order it without? Do I order it with and without contrast? Do I order oral contrast? Do I order a special type of CT? What? How do I? What do I order? Okay, and so. Um, this goes to back to whatever institution you're ordering at. Some radiology programs will just, as long as you're in the ballpark, the radiologist will look at that and then X out whatnot and protocol it the way that to, to um, emphasize what you're looking for to answer your question. Okay? But you have to be aware, some departments may not even do that and they depend on you. You, you didn't order contrast, you got a non-contrast study when the contrast was needed. So it's kind of important to know what, you know, do you order contrast or non-contrast, okay? So phases of IV contrast. So um, remember, when we inject it through the veins, you can, depending on how long you wait before you scan, you have different phases, okay? So you can have, we can do a non-contrast first, and then we inject. Let's say we wait 35 seconds after you've injected, okay? That's more of an arterial phase. The, uh, the contrast is still in your arteries, okay? If you wait longer, about 70 seconds, okay, you're in the portal venous phase. That means the contrast is now progressed, now it's in the veins, draining back, okay? And then there's even delayed phases when it's like you wait three to six minutes after you've injected contrast, and it all gives a different appearance. So here are some pictures. This is a non-contrast study again. There's oral contrast, but let's, we're just talking about IV. So there's no contrast in the aorta when we looked at non-contrast. So here, the aorta is bright. This is an arterial phase. Okay, this is before it has a, a chance for the organs to perfuse. So you notice the organs are not right yet, bright, really bright yet. This is if you wait a few more seconds. Okay, you notice the aorta is less bright, and the veins, the splenic vein, this is a portal vein. This is more bright. So you're in the venous draining phase, and you notice that the liver and the spleen it has a chance to the contrast has chance to circulate through these organs and perfuse the organs. This is the kidneys, again the cortex and the uh, um, uh, renal pyramids, medulla. Okay, And if you wait even longer, this is maybe like five minutes um, after you've injected contrast, the contrast is being excreted by the kidney, so it's in the collecting system, but you notice everything is start to look gray again. Okay, So of these four things, uh, four different phases, I would say portal venous phase is the most common used for general imaging of the abdomen. Okay, you, you, you can see why. Okay, you can see just much more detail. The vessels, the uh, livers, the most you know most enhancing kidneys. Okay, this is the general phase that most indications would get. Okay, this phase is more looking at um, the arteries uh, in detail um, and. 
you don't have to know all, all the phases, but just know that just because we order a contrast study doesn't not all contrast studies are equivalent, meaning depending on if you get an arterial phase or uh, portal venous, you don't need to know this as an ordering physician, but the radiologist obviously knows and will tailor the study to get the right phase to answer the question you're looking for. So let's say um, you're looking for a hepatocellular cancer in the liver, okay? Well, you say you saw, oh, a CT was done a month ago, okay? But it was done for abdominal pain and only this phase was done. Well, an arterial phase is key for looking for uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, and just because you have a CT with contrast doesn't mean you actually got the right phases you needed to look for that indication. So if that indication for abdominal pain was for this, and you think, oh, it was just done a month ago, okay, do I need another CT? Well, you probably would need another CT, with the, which has different phases. Okay? Or you can ask the radiologist, do you see anything? In this, I was looking for this. Does the CT answer the question? It's a different question from which the indication the original study was ordered from, but does it help me? Okay, and feel free to ask the radiologist. Okay, so this is another example of timing. This is again, we're back in the chest, and I've shown you where the contrast is highlighting the pulmonary arteries okay, for PE. And now if I wanted to highlight the aorta, but notice the aorta is not as much highlighted. You need to wait a few more seconds. And now the aorta in this study, uh, a CTA, also a CTA, but now we're looking at the aorta. It's bright in the aorta, but not as bright in the pulmonary arteries. So this, this study was tailored to look at the aorta. The study was tailored to look at the pulmonary arteries. Okay? And basically, you don't need to order a different test per se. You just need to tell us, oh, here I'm looking for PE. Here, I'm looking for a urine dissection, per, per se. Okay. Benefits of oral contrast. So now, getting away from IV contrast, oral contrast is when you drink it, it's uh, usually made out of a different substance like barium. Okay. But again, it's the same principle. It's attenuating x-ray beam, so it's bright okay, for the most part. There are other oral, I won't get into that. But it basically, the benefits is it distinguishes bowel from adjacent structures. And I'll, show you pictures. It can distend the bowel so it looks at the wall thickness and you're able to depend on how fast it goes through the bowel okay and uh, evaluate the bowel transit okay to look for maybe partial bowel obstruction okay so I'll, I'll tell you where it's not really needed. Bowel leak if there's a um, leakage or perforation of the bowel you can see the contrast leaving the site of the leak and that um, is a benefit of oral contrast okay so just an example, because um, so you get a picture. This this side is non or without oral contrast, and you see this is the stomach. Okay? The stomach is collapsed. Okay, there's not much air in it. You think you look at the wall of the stomach. Is that thickened stomach? I don't know. But you give oral contrast, and it distends the stomach. And look at how thin the wall is. That's because when you have a distensible structure and it's collapsed, the wall tends to appear thick, thicker. But if you distend it just like a balloon, you blow it up, the wall is thin. And so you, we see that this was not really about wall thickening. This was just because it's under distended. And when I give oral contrast, it distends the stomach and you have a thin wall. Okay? And then you look at the non without oral contrast and what are these structures? I know just because of looking at it, I know these are bowel. Okay? Uh, this is bowel with air, but these are bowel without air. Okay? And, but when you give oral contrast, you can highlight, okay, well, now I know this is bowel, and I know this is vessel. You know, you can distinguish between different structures. Okay. Same with this. Does, does that mean you need oral contrast for most indications? Probably not. In ER, emergency room, they don't like this. They don't want oral contrast because you have to make the patient drink. They have to, it takes maybe an hour, hour and a half, two hours to get through the bowel, and then that's time that the patient is occupying their ER space. So they'd rather just no oral contrast. Um, sometimes they don't even want to give IV contrast, which is sometimes wrong, but um, they don't want to give oral contrast because it takes time to get through the bowel. Okay? But it can be helpful in different indications. Okay, so let's, let's talk about fluoroscopy. Okay? So oral contrast for fluoroscopy, same kind of principle. You're giving something that attenuates x-ray. Okay, you can give a barium and someone, 
talked about gastrographin. Gastrographin is a water-soluble contrast. Barium is not. Okay? So if you're talking about a post-surgery patient with a potentially a bowel leak, the uh, surgeon does not want barium all over the peritoneum. It's messy, it's thick, it's, it's just yucky. Okay? You want something water-soluble, that it's almost like water if it spills into the peritoneum. It's inert. Um, it's just kind of like water, and the surgeon can deal with that. Okay? So that's the difference between barium and water-soluble, or uh, commonly a type of water-soluble is gastrographin. Okay? So that's the difference. Okay, so oral contrast for CT okay, is a more diluted version of oral contrast from fluoroscopy. Fluoroscopy, if you don't know, it's a continuous live monitoring x-ray where the radiologist is there taking pictures as the contrast goes through. Okay. CT, basically you give the patient oral contrast and you wait, I guess, an hour, two hours, and then you, you CT scan them. Okay. And it's you notice it's a den less dense contrast than um, floral contrast. Makes sense because CT, you think of it's basically hundreds, thousands of x-rays going through your body in different angles. So it's, you don't need as bright contrast as you do fluoroscopy. That's how I think about that. Okay, so again, compare. This is just an x-ray done after CT contrast. It's less dense than fluoroscopy contrast. But you can see the difference. Okay, so here's a question. Okay, kind of classic radiology question. If you have a patient with the failure of abdominal pain, your attending decides you need to get a barium esophagram and a CT abdominal pelvis, which one would you do first? Okay, you need the you need both tests, the barium esophagram for dysphagia, abdominal pain, you want the CT. Okay, so which study would you do the first do first? Okay. So I had a few answers that said CT, okay, which is not the right answer, okay? The reason for that is that, and it kind of goes to this picture, okay? If I know fluoroscopy, if I did, um, oh, no, no, you're right. I mixed myself up. CT is the correct answer. Sorry about that. So um, you would get CT because it's less dense contrast. Okay. If, let's say, um, you got fluoroscopy and you give this dense oral contrast and you tried to then, you did the fluoroscopy and then you did the CT, you, um, you would scan this, this contrast would be way too bright. Okay. And this, this is what this is. This is a CT scan done after a fluoroscopy and then this is the contrast used for fluoroscopy. Way too bright, causes all this artifact. It's bright, you know, the x-ray beams can't, Kind of, it just this just a dense structure. Okay, so forgive me. You're right. CT is the right answer. Okay, so but just by knowing that fluoroscopy is a denser contrast, you know, okay, let me do that last. Okay, I can let's say I did the CT and it's this. I can still give dense contrast, and I just have to kind of look past this lighter contrast, and I look to the more dense contrast when I do the um, uh, fluoroscopy as a second study. Okay, so hopefully I didn't confuse anyone. I apologize. Okay, so yes, contrast too bright obscures the CT. Please do the CT first before the fluoroscopy exam. Okay. Risks of IV contrast. Okay, so I believe um, uh, Dr. Tam may have gone through some of these, so I'm just going to go briefly through these. Um, the risk of IV contrast. Um, for CT, let's start off allergy. The contrast, it can hurt your kidneys. It's ne it can be nephrotoxic. Yeah, oh, not yet. Okay. Um, so we'll we'll do we'll talk about more extravasation from the IV side. Basically, the IV that the t uh, whoever puts in is maybe half in the vein, and when they go to inject, it's a rapid bolus. It's like a power injection. It if half the uh, contrast spills into your arm, that obviously can be extremely painful. That can also be risky for different reasons. We'll get into that. And we'll talk about risk for pregnant uh, patients, fetuses. Okay. And um, the overall incidence of allergic reactions to IV contrast overall, pretty small, you know, less than 1%, 0.6%. 
serious fraction, okay, even smaller, 0.1%. Okay, this is going to scare people, okay, death, okay. The death for IV contrast is unknown, okay. There's no study that we've done. And the conservative estimate is one per 200,000. So that does that mean every 200,000 patients we scan with contrast, one person can die? Possibly, but probably it's, that's, that's a little conservative. Maybe more like half a million. Okay, but everyone thinks, oh, half a million. I'm that one in a million patient who dies. Okay, so it tells you that yes, there is risk to contrast, and we have to think about when is it needed or not. But you also have to weigh the benefit. If the without doing the contrast, if it doesn't answer a critical question, doesn't tell them if they have cancer or not, doesn't help tell them if they have acute appendicitis or not. You know, you're doing a disservice by not giving the contrast for this small risk. So what are the allergic reactions? You can get anywhere from rash, which is very common, to death. Okay, Okay. so what if you have an uh, allergic reaction? Uh, treatments are, you know, AB, ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. This is if a patient is coding, you know, a serious reaction, epinephrine, uh, and basically pray because some I've seen patients just, you know, um, not survive long. You don't have much time. Okay? So pre-medication. So what if you had a, a light reaction? You just have a rash. Okay, well then, and you need a, st a future study for CT. Uh, pre-medication um, is good. You, there's some recent studies that you don't, sometimes for a rash, you don't even need pre-medication. We'll just scan it. Okay? Get a rash. Okay, fine. fine. But um, pre-medication, uh, people make the mistake, oh, patient had a reaction. I can always pre-medicate on my next study. Well, my question to that, the physician, when they do that, well, is it a severe reaction? Because if the patient almost died, well, I'm not going to trust pre-medication. Pre-medication lowers the risk, but it's not going to eliminate the risk. So if the patient almost died, I'm not going to be feel comfortable giving pre-medication for a patient that needs contrast. I'm going to have to think about another way. Maybe MRI contrast, which is a different contrast. Um, it doesn't have cross-reactivity with CT, so it's uh, safe to give. Or do a non-contrast study or find some other way to do it. Okay? The standard prep for pre-medication is usually an oral prep. Prednisone and Prednisol is 13 hours. There is a faster prep for more in emergency cases. You need five hours for that. Okay? So you don't need to know these numbers, uh, but know that there, it does take time. It delays the exam, okay? but, um, but sometimes you have to. Okay, let's talk about contrast-induced nephropathy. CIN, CIN, okay? So based on your creatinine, you can calculate a GFR, and that's based on your creatinine, your age, um, weight, okay, I put weight, gender, and sometimes race, okay? And so this number, these numbers, I do kind of want you to know. I think there may be a test on that, okay? So normal GFR, 90, mild insulin is 60 to uh, 89, moderate, okay, and severe renal insufficiency, less than 30 GFR, obviously not correct, okay? Okay, these, this lecture is going to be available for you, so if you're taking notes, you're going to have a chance to go through this on your own, okay? So creatinine, GFR, okay, what is it needed to safely use IV contract? That's a, not an easy question. It depends on your institution, okay? So at the VA, where I'm from, we follow the ACR 2018 contrast manual, and basically, um, something for you to know, 45, or this kind of moderate renal insufficiency, anything above 45, basically there's no issues. We scan it with contrast, no problem, okay? 30 to 44, and if it's stable, like meaning it's been that way for many months, years even, you know, it's still kind of moderate, um, uh, you know, ACR, American College of Radiology, and other uh, research studies, it's basically a low risk of nephrotoxicity. Okay, and so basically, I would just think twice, do I need the contrast? If the patient has cancer and I'm staging, and contrast is, def is in my mind, um, really needed for something that's very really low risk to the kidneys, I'm going to give contrast. Okay? Um, no con so our policy, no contrast below 30 unless the patient is on chronic dialysis. Obviously, on chronic dialysis, the kidneys are gone. They don't need their kidneys anymore. They're going to get dialysis. I'm not trying. If I hurt the kidneys, they're already gone anyways. Okay? Or an emergency. Okay? Trauma. I don't, you know, that's 
diagnosing the trauma is more important than this potential low risk of nephrotoxicity. Okay, um, but as for the most part, any I think under thirty, we try to refrain from contrast. Okay, so do I need to check a creatinine or a GFR for every patient? No, but in general, here's the criteria that you do. Okay, you don't again, you don't need to know it. Just know older patients over sixty, any problem with kidneys, then it's a good idea to check uh, a patient with hypertension, diabetes. Good idea to check the creatinine. Uh, younger patients, no history of kidney stuff, hypertension, diabetes, we'll just scan. Okay, okay so in general, um, you don't need to know this part, but basically, um, if you, um, how far bef before repeat, let's say I gave a, a patient had a contrast study and they were like, oh, I, I forgot, I needed another contrast study, okay, but patient got the max amount of contrast. Okay, check with the radiologist because the patient may have reached that max, and you would have to wait about 24 hours before you can get the next contrast study, unless it's an emergency. But uh, you know, check with the radiologist what's permissible. Okay, if um, the GFR is less than 30, and remember that's kind of the higher risk, um, metformin and metformin derivatives like glucophage, um, they're supposed to stop metformin 24 hours after the contrast reaction, uh, contrast injection, okay? And they're supposed to check a GFR to restart or cranning to see if they can restart. Okay? The reason is if in a patient with low kidney function, metformin can precipitate lactic acidosis. And so metformin um, doesn't mean if the patient already had metformin, it's fine. You can still give contrast. It's just that they should stop 48 hours after you've given so just because the patient uh, takes metformin, it's fine. They can get the contrast. We just have to tell them. And if their GFR is low and you need the contrast, okay, then you can tell them to stop metformin, get a lab test after 40 hours. Okay? So no need to cancel the study just because they're taking it. Extrapolation, the IV site, um, basically you don't deal with this as much. Basically we need to know as a radiologist, we'll check on the the site, so we'll look for skin breakdown, we'll perform a neuromuscular exam. Most cases are mild. We just give them some hot or warm, or cold or warm compresses. You know, the swelling should decrease. Now, if it's really tight and they start having neuro symptoms, then that's a concern for compartments and syndrome, and then we would refer to the ER, and maybe even plastic surgery uh, to treat that. Okay, so, but you don't really have to deal with that, so I don't want to spend too much time. Pregnant patients, you always get questions. Um, as the orient physician, you'll have a pregnant patient, and they're going to ask you, can I get IV? I'm, I'm scared. Okay? And so uh, tests have shown there's no adverse reaction to IV contrast to the fetus, but it's not like they have gone to do an uh, um, IRB-approved study. That study would probably never be done because, you know, you're dealing with a fetus. But there's insufficient evidence to conclude that there's no risk. Okay? So the, the, the take-home point is you can use IV contrast in a pregnant patient when you consult a radiologist and the um, um, different departments have different um, um, ways you go about that. Some want a neuro neurology consult say it's okay. okay? So, but the principles are can you get the information without contrast okay? or can you get it with another imaging modality, ultrasound, MRI. Okay? Um, is the info needed to take care of that patient and the fetus during that pregnancy? Meaning, can you, is urgent enough that I need that study, I need the contrast that it's indicated, it will help me make that diagnosis, um, and it's not prudent to wait till after the patient is no longer pregnant. So these are the kind of the questions, kind of risk benefit analysis you have to have um, in mind when you uh, think about ordering these studies. Okay, so expected contrast dose to an infant from, let's say, breast milk. They'll, they'll ask you, can, is it okay for me to breastfeed? Extremely low dose to, um, to the mother um, as well as to the fetus. Okay? Um, from, the, sorry, to the, to the, this should say to the fetus. Okay? For gadolinium, this is MR contrast 0.0004%. Okay? So the recommendations are breast milk is safe. But if the mother's still worried, and you would you can advise them. Well, you can pump for 24 hours, discard it, and then restart the breastfeeding. Okay, that just kind of appeases them, but it's 
you know, if they started to feed right away, that's, that's no problem. You know, high risk of IV contrast for MRI. Now the only real difference it has the MR contrast really has the same. You can have allergic reactions, you can have extrapolation, you can have. We'll talk about risks of the pregnant patient, but the real difference is that MR MR contrast, gadolinium based contrast, doesn't hurt the kidneys. Okay, now. There's something that's called nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, or we abbreviate it NSF. Okay, so what is NSF? NSF is relatively recent, first described in two, the year 2000, uh, noted to occur with patients. So back before 2000, we said, okay, well, patient has renal failure. We can't, uh, patients on dialysis, we can't give CT contrast, but let's give MR contrast. So they did that, you know, for millions of patients. Um, but there were reports out there starting in 2000 that these patients, especially with patients with end-stage renal disease on dialysis with gadolinium, they started having this weird disease, fibrosing disease, that mainly affects the skin but can involve organs, okay? And basically it's fibrosis of the skin and different organs, okay? Sometimes extremely painful and sometimes can cause death, okay? So what's the mechanism? Basically it's... Um, Okay, um, basically because the kidneys are involved with excreting uh, the contrast, just like CT, same for MRI. If you have kidney failure, okay, th those gadolin it hangs around longer, and it's thought to have these free ions bind with other ions in protein, and they precipitate in salt, and they they cause fibrosis. Okay, so that's the mechanism. So it is related to kidney failure. Uh, but really only seen in end-stage renal patients on dialysis. Okay, so what does it look like? This is a fibrosing skin. This is all fibrosed. Um, that's kind of what it looks like. Okay. It's, been, it's only been, you know, out of the millions of exams we do, 700 cases. Okay. Um, and really, remember the GFR. This is why it's kind of somewhat important to, to know these numbers. Remember, less than 30 for CT with severe renal deficiencies. Even then, it's a 1% to 7% risk of NSF, and usually with dialysis patients. Okay? 30 and beyond, almost no cases of NSF. So for us, anything above 30, we're going to give um, MR contrast, no problem. Okay? A newer gadolinium gado agents have even less risk, and uh, they've uh, started with giving um, patients with less than a GFR of 30. Um, these newer agents, okay? So except for the patients on dialysis, we don't give MR contrast because um, that's when you have the cases of NSF. So recommendations, again, for us, anything above the 30, no issue, scan, give contrast, no problem. Less than 30, the risk is very small, okay? But this is when you should have a risk-benefit discussion, too much like we had it for CT, okay? And we require consent and informing the patient. Um, the, again, uh, there's certain agents we can give that have uh, have no reported uh, NSF, so yes. Okay, um, pregnant patients getting like CT contrast, no adverse effects, excuse me, demonstrated, uh, but there's not enough info to make a definitive determination. So uh, basically we say no gadolinium to pregnant patients unless it's a real emergency. Okay. And so that gives an end to, let me see, oh, perfect, in three more minutes. So any questions in the three minutes we have? Great, so if there's no questions, um, we're going to post uh, this um, so you can, this uh, webinar, and you can review that, and also this, uh, the PowerPoint of both lectures.